Hi, it's Matthew White here and we're on the Online Prosperity Show. Today I'm going to drop the three or four major nuggets that are going to provide you with a higher level of sales and raise your conversions to the roof. So make sure you watch all the way to the end because we've got some great ideas going, coming towards you. Thanks a lot. See you soon. Now, Welcome to yet another exciting episode of the Online Prosperity Show. And today we've got none other than Matthew. Matthew, how are you doing, my man? I'm excellent. Thank you, Prosper. How are you today? Fantastic. And thank you so much for your time. You know, guys, Matthew is a highly successful entrepreneur. And the reason why we've got him here on the show today is because he has been running his own businesses and, and in particular sales teams since he was 22. That was almost 20 years ago. So he was regularly out selling and you know, all the long established players that might have been in all the markets that he's been working in. Now Matthew is relentless and his thirst for knowledge and his ability to actually apply that knowledge in the real world situations have made him into a truly versatile salesperson. Now Matthew, did I say that right? Look, uh, for an introduction that I wrote myself, you did perfectly. So thank you for that. <laughs> Understandable. <laughs> now, obviously, um, for the viewer, again, if you're watching this video, you know that we truly want that your business to become profitable and enjoyable. And in the process, that's the reason why we're bringing in experts like this, because you would never um, you know, know what they know. And we are always learning from people that have already done or are already where we want to be. Now, Matthew, let us know a little bit about your, um, you know, your, your history with the sales teams ever since you were 22, maybe up until today, and part of what you've done that constitutes you to become an expert in sales. Yeah, okay, look, that's a good question. So first of all, I want to apologize for the viewers today. I'm moving at the moment, so there's stuff everywhere. Uh, but uh, but just listen and don't look uh, to, uh, to what we're uh, talking about today. So empty bookshelves. It's not that I'm uh, keeping just these little knickknacks up there. There's actual books that probably go on there normally in, in those boxes. So look, just to give you a bit of an overview over the last, say, 20 years of how I've been in sales. I started my first tech company when I was 22. Uh, that is almost 20 years ago. I turned 42 next, uh, next week now. And, uh, and what I realized very, very quickly is that I wasn't in a tech business. Even though we built software, we serviced software, we provided software, what we were is a sales and marketing business and what we delivered is the product. And so I think the greatest challenges, the first piece of takeaway I'd like to offer everybody on the call today is you know, remind yourself that you are, whilst you, your great business and your great product, you might sell great mice or whatever, but you need to shift your focus in the business. If you want to really scale, if you want to really scale in your business, think I'm a sales and marketing business and my delivery is whatever I do. So that's the first thing that I really learned back uh, some 20 years ago. Over the course of that time, we had some, some reasonably high levels of success. We uh, moved into other software types of businesses, managed services for larger corporates. We build uh, for the tech people in the room, CRM and ERP systems for corporates. Uh, we then also uh, had, goodness, a real estate agency. We uh, bred racehorses. We, we've done literally at one stage, I was sitting at the head of the table, about 28. Uh, we had seven businesses, uh, about 70 staff, and it was just a, a lot going on. And each one of those businesses, whether we were importing health products, or selling software or providing services to large corporates. It was always not about the product and service. Products and services, if, if you don't mind me saying, and I don't want to offend anybody here, products and services are most of the time commoditized. You can find them new, today, especially in 2017, you can find them cheaper, you can find them faster than pretty much what anybody can deliver in Australia and, uh, and in the you know, UK or England, wherever you're looking at. So what do you have got to do? You've got to provide higher levels of value and know that you're in the sales and marketing business. So I was actually speaking with the, uh, uh, this country, sorry, the Queensland director of Optus uh, in, a, in, in Brisbane just last week. And we were sitting there having a couple of beers overlooking the river, watching the fireworks last week. And, and he said, you know, we're, you know, chat, 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 we're in a sales and marketing business. And I wanted to stop him there and say, look, you get that, right? Optus, they're, they're doing telco, they're pulling lines through, they're connecting people up, they've got the fastest internet speeds as far as Netflix is concerned for the last couple of years in a row. What business are they in? 
sales and marketing. So, you know, so just to go back to me, um, the, my history has been around sales always. Uh, I realized that there is a difference between sales and marketing, and that's something a lot of business owners don't get. And so over the course of my time, I've sold about personally and the businesses that I've owned about $100 million worth of products and services. And I've always worked in this, I played in the sales room and worked in the boardroom. Always loved that sales piece, that client interaction piece. So a couple of years ago, I um, took a year off when our um, second son was born. He was a, uh, in year, just about to go into school. We took a year off, lived in Bali for a year. I knew I was turning uh, 40 soon. And I thought, what do I want to do with my second life? Because the first 20 years, I think, was a, a reasonably good apprenticeship. What's the next 20 years going to be like? And I thought, you know, what do people ask me about? What they ask me about is sales. Hey, Matt, can you come and help me with this sales team? Hey, can you help me think about this strategy? What are we doing here? How do we enter this market? So that's exactly what I did. So 18 months ago, came back from overseas, started this business. And, um, and so just I, I want to add some more value here for your, your listeners, if that's okay. Thank you. I've always believed, and I heard it once told to me by Roger Hamilton, it's always easier to parachute into the top of the mountain than climb the mountain. So I thought to myself, if I want to be a sales trainer, coach, speaker, get out there in the world stage, rather than me having to grind and build my own profile and, and, and build my own brand and grow that over the course of the next, say, 10 or 15 years, how could I parachute into the top of the mountain? And what that looked like is I went ahead and found the top 10 global sales gurus. Uh, there's a list. Though. There's a list for everything on the internet. Top 10 sales global gurus. And emailed them and messaged them and LinkedIn messaged them. Hey, I'm interviewing people for my sales podcast. Do you mind if I grab uh, 20 minutes of your time? Sort of like what you're doing. Some of them responded. I interviewed some of them. And one of them in particular, I actually had a really good um, relationship with. We continued our conversations. And in continuing those conversations, Bob, Bob Urichuk, he was voted eight, eighth in the world since 2008. So, you know, significant pedigree. So what he did is he said, hey, look, I'm retiring. I said, well, look, you know what? Um, would you like somebody to carry the banner forward? And that's how I've become part of the Velocity Selling crew. I'm now CEO of Velocity Selling. And we're able to, uh, I'm able to now uh, expand on the work that's already been done. So here's a tip for the people out there is who's already done it? Who's already in your industry that is currently doing it or done it? How do you get a conversation with them? Because you know what? The most successful people are the ones most happy to share. People who I think they're in competition are usually the middle to low level of business. I, I'm constantly blown away by the ability and the capacity for people who are really at high levels of success to give their time, energy and effort to people who genuinely want to learn something. Not just somebody who wants to climb the ladder and, and, and uh, as I say, hump their leg, which is probably not a very nice way of putting it, but, um, but you know, just, to, just clamp onto them like a Klingon. We're looking, you know, how do you provide value to these people? And so that's, that's a little bit about my journey and how I was able to parachute into the top of the mountain of, of global corporate sales training, speaking and coaching rather than having to climb it myself. Does that make sense? It makes a lot of sense. And thank you so much for that value. Um, obviously, it's 20 years condensed into two minutes. So, obviously, you know, it, it just makes a lot of sense for me there. Thank you so much for sharing that. You see, you raised a very valid point that, um, everybody's in the business of sales and marketing and you are not just selling a product, but you are actually having to make sure that somebody makes a purchase of that product. Now in your 20 years, you probably would have realized that most sales trainers and consultants have got it wrong, especially them focusing on just the one liners of always be closing or all the slow, um, you know, sales um, techniques that are out there on the market and how to just handle objections. Can you give us a, a brief overview of what you actually mean when you say, you know, all the sales trainers have actually got it wrong by having the mindset of always be closing? Yeah, look, you know, so that always be closing idea come from an era where people were introduced to the idea by the salesperson. They didn't know they had a problem. Salesperson walks up and says, you've got this problem. Uh, your vacuum doesn't suck well enough. You need whatever, whatever the, the thing might have been. They create the problem and then solve it. Typical advertising and marketing way of dealing with things. But that's in the 50s and 60s. 2017, the current data tells us 
that your buyers are starting the buyer's journey by themselves. They're starting it on Google. They're starting it over, over the barbecue. They're starting it by speaking with their peers. There are literally dozens and dozens of networking meetings, peer-to-peer -peer meetings occurring every single day. Go on to Meetup and type in anything and you will see literally hundreds of meetings happening today in your city. So um, what that means is people are, people are percolating an idea. So the current data tells us they're 75% away along the buyer journey before they make contact with the company. So what does that mean? So what that means now is you need to be able to identify, quickly relate, identify the issues the client is having, not by over-talking, by over-listening. The most successful meetings that I have are ones where in the, in the hour that I do, and this is not indicative of what I normally, uh, how I normally operate, but the normal sales meetings, if I speak for more than 10 minutes out of an hour, I've failed. I give myself an F, a fail mark. Because it's not about me, my products, my services, my, uh, my capacity. It's actually about them, their problem. So as we move through the buyer's journey, as we move through how um, customers want to operate, because uh, I'm, I'm going to park an idea here just for a moment. I'll, I'll come back to that in a sec. Um, buyers have, uh, let me, salespeople over the course of the last couple of millennia have taught buyers how to buy. Now, I mean, this is, this is something I teach in my, in my programs, but I want to do that for your listeners today. And because it's, it's actually a realization that once you receive that realization, people will know that they're doing it. And in knowing that you're doing it, you can be aware of it. And by being aware of it, you can stop doing it. So here it is. So there's four stages of how every buying interaction occurs. So think, for example, uh, you walk into a store with your, uh, with your partner. Uh, my wife, for example, when we walk into a store, the, Lee, uh, the shop assistant says, hi, can I help you? And what do you think my wife says? Your wife is probably going to be like, no, we're all right. Yeah, that's right. No, thanks. Just looking. So the first step is lie to the salesperson. I don't want it. I don't like it. I don't trust it. So the first step in every buying interaction is, is lie to the salesperson because you know what? You're just getting in first because emotionally right down deep, people are, are terrified of being taken advantage by a salesperson. So step one, go away salesperson. Step two, now let's say you've been able to break through that step two of every buying interaction is free consulting. And so Prosper, uh, I'm, I won't put you on the spot here today, but you know, how many times do clients call you up because you're a marketing expert and say, what are the three or four main strategies you use? And, they go, and you might answer it or you might, you might have a better way of dealing with that. But most of the time marketers will say, oh, well we use social, we use this, we use that. And the, then their buyer says, why? How does it work? How often do you post? What flavor is it? What color is it? How big is it? How tall is it? How fat is it? And what happens is by answering questions, you're actually losing control of the sale. The best way to unravel that, and that's called free consulting. So step two is get free consulting. So if you just think about your, uh, your business, and you probably don't do this, but for the people watching in your business, they're, think, they're sitting there going, well, when the client's asking questions, that means they're interested. No, they're being lazy and they're actually making you human Google. So the, really, the, how you answer that, and this is for all the listeners out there, if somebody says, oh, how, um, do you guys use social for your marketing? The answer is not yes. The answer is, look, we've got a number of ways of attracting new business. What business outcome are you looking to achieve? And they go, oh, well, I'm looking to generate 10 new leads a week. And how will that affect your business? Oh, well, uh, having 10 new leads a week on my current run rate of one deal per 10, that means an extra sale per week. Oh, really? And what does an extra sale per week mean to your business? Well, an extra sale to my business means an extra $10,000. Oh, so what you're saying here is you're looking to actually develop a plan that's actually going to put an extra $120,000 of business in your company over the course of 12 months. Is that what I'm hearing? They go, yes. So let's work together to figure out a way to make sure that we can put an extra 120 grand in your business. Do you care whether it's social? Do you care whether it's a guy out in the street with a sandwich board? Do you care if we're doing door knocking? Does it actually matter to you? 99.9% .9 of business owners couldn't give a, a, a damn what the platform is. They want the result. So step two is free consulting and there's a really easy way to unravel that by saying we've got a number of ways of dealing with that. What's the business outcome you're looking to achieve? So step three. Uh, I know I'm sort of going long here, but hopefully this is helping. Step it three. Is, it is. Thank you so much. And uh, yeah, thank you so much for unpacking this. So, <laughs> Step number three. 
this is, this is really cool. So, so step three is, uh, let's say you've gone to the meeting. I'm just talking about most salespeople or most business owners here, Prosper. You've gone to the meeting. You've answered all of their questions. You get to the end and you say, what do you think? So the, the, the business owner says, well, let me think about it. Send me a proposal. I've got to talk to my uh, board, my astrologist, my dog, uh, my what, whoever. <laughs> you know? So, so what are they doing? Step three is the same as step one. Lie to the salesperson. It's a lie. They're, they're, and also, you send them a proposal, and then what do you say? Because you've done a good job, you've got their name, you've got their details, you've answered questions. What do you do next? You say, when can I follow you up? And the person says, oh, probably Friday. And you go, great, I've got permission to follow up. And what happens next is that you follow up on Friday. And because you've made it your job to follow up, not the person receiving the proposal's job to actually read it, they get your phone call. They go, oh, Prosper's calling. I haven't done that yet. Deny the call. And now on Monday happens, you call them back or you send them an email. And now they feel sort of guilty and a bit weird about denying your call because you're a good bloke. And, uh, and, Oh, oh, deny. And then by the time they do that, they move into stage four, which is hide. They don't return calls. They don't come back to you on the proposal. They don't do anything. So, so let me unpack that and how to unravel that. You know, I use this every day. And people know what I'm doing because I'm selling, selling. Like this is the most uh, meta thing anybody could do is sell sales because in, in immediately people think that I'm going to be the great salesperson in the room. So they're immediately, their antenna are up thinking, oh, here it comes, here comes the heavy clothes. So if a person, and in the corporate work that I do, I work with corporates, I work with sales teams of 50 plus. So when I'm actually going to send them a proposal, because they need a proposal to take, to actually do need to take it to the board, this is how I actually stop stage four happening. Hey, Prosper, I'm happy to send you a proposal. I'll probably get that to you by Tuesday. If you receive it by Tuesday, when would it be reasonable for me to receive a call back about that? So you leave it in their, in, in their hands to actually, you know, make the follow-up then. And they go, oh, probably Friday. Oh, okay, great. So look, if you miss that commitment on Friday, is it okay if I follow you up on Monday? And they go, yeah, absolutely. All right, because now they have made a commitment in their head. It, they would look stupid and foolish and they don't want to go against what they've committed to. Okay, all right. <laughs> so Prospect, remember this. Everything that the salesperson or business owner says is questionable in the mind of the prospect. But everything this prospect says is brilliant, true, and correct. As far Because truth is the truth for the speaker 100% of the time. Unless they're genuinely trying to, to, to mislead you. And if you build a level of rapport, that won't happen. Now, unless somebody's set out to actually lie to you, everything they say as far as they're concerned, is the truth. All right. So, so you want to get them to agree. Beg your pardon? Sorry, you want to get them to start agreeing and following through and, you know, making themselves accountable so that they would follow through with the proposal and everything else that comes along with it. Yeah. Because you know what? You are the expert in marketing or you are the expert, you know, whoever's listening today, you are the expert in, in printing or whatever the thing is. You, they're not qualified to ask you questions because they're not paying for your advice. Hey, if they're paying you the hourly rate that you deserve, three or $400 an hour, if they're paying you that hourly rate, then answer as many questions as you like because there's a value exchange and they'll value that advice. But if you're giving free advice, they won't value it, they won't take action on it and nothing will occur. Understandable. So obviously the sales game has actually changed. And unless you and your sales team are adding massive value, like you're saying, you know, the client may as well just go out and find a better price online because everybody's competing on price now, right? As soon as you drop into that proposal follow-up cycle, then you become commoditized and people go and say, well, Prosper's done a good job. I'm personally and emotionally sold on doing some social media marketing. I'm personally sold on uh, so, um, okay, well, look, um, so, so that's, the, that's how buyers buy. And, and so there's always a way where you can add way more value to a, um, to a client and the interaction. Because allowing a client to speak and allowing a client to really fully explore their issues is serving the client. Answering questions is not what you're there to do. You're there to qualify your buyer 
You're there to ensure that there is a genuine opportunity or not. You're there to understand their needs. You're, understand, you're there to understand their budget. And if they say, I don't have a budget, the answer is, well, how are you looking to fix this problem? 99.9% .9 of the time when clients say they don't have a budget they, or they say, haven't got much, I always come back with, well, how are you looking to solve this? And by just asking that question and not folding on price, I'll often get actually paid more than I was thinking. And so what I do then is I actually provide greater levels of value and support to the customer. Great. It's not about my budget, my issues, my product, my service. It's about them, what they can do. Understandable. Thank you so much. Now, obviously, Matthew, you have given us the four step, um, you know, scenario that you're talking about that us as salespeople or as marketing people, we've actually trained um, our customers to start lying to us. So you need to debug that and make sure that you're getting the most, um, you know, out of your customer because normally they just want to get rid of the salesperson as soon as possible because everybody likes buying stuff but they don't actually like being sold to. Okay, now in that four-step sort of process that you're talking about there, Matthew, is there some sort of, you know, questions and some way of questioning that then brings the customer into the, 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 the sort of um, line that we want them to be going to, just break the pattern that they already, um, you know, used to so they can align to not lying to us and just really telling us where their budget is, um, you know, what their needs are and how actually they are going to be um, footing the bills, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, absolutely. So, so the first one is, is, as how I mentioned earlier, which is not answering questions. First one is to actually try to find out what the business issues are. And then I call it the rule of three plus or in velocity selling, we call it the rule of three plus. Don't let an answer occur without exploring it three layers deep. So for example, um, what are you looking to achieve? Oh, I need a new website. What are the results you're trying to actually achieve from that website? Oh, we need more leads. How many more leads? They go, I don't know. I said, well, okay, so current run rate, how many leads do you need to get a sale? Let's go back to the previous example. I need 10. Okay. How many new sales a week do you need? Three. So you need 30 new leads a week. Is that right? Yes. And what will the impact of 30 new leads a week have for three new sales? X dollars. And if you don't get that, then I actually ratchet back the other way and, and say, what are the consequences for not actually getting those extra three sales a week? And they go, oh, well, well, just, you know, nothing. Right. So, so, so is there any value in actually doing it anyway? If there's no, if there's no impact, if there's no consequences of actually not undertaking this new marketing or undertaking this new product or service, then why, we, why bother even doing it? And that takes a bit of guts. That takes a bit of confidence to deliver that question. But you know what? Do it and you'll see massive change in there. You'll see where your customer goes, oh, well, actually, no, we do need to do that. Why is that? Well, the, we need to actually do that because of this, this, and this, and market shift. And, and one thing I've actually, one question I asked, which is takes a lot of strength and a lot of personal positioning is, so what will be the impact to you and your family if you get this wrong? I've asked that question to a general manager of an Australian publicly listed company. So if any of your people out there, any of your viewers out there think they can't ask that question because the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the client in front of them has a bigger business than they do, they are wrong. At that time, when I asked that question, I was a one-man operator, just me, sitting with that guy, and that was going to be, if I won that contract, which I did, if I, if I didn't get that contract, the consequences for me, was not being able to put my kids in school. Right. So you've got to ask your own consequence questions and you've got to ask that and you've got to be as strong with your customers. Understand. That. that that is a powerful question because if you ask somebody how much it's actually costing them for them not to go ahead with your service, then they start, you know, looking at it in their own terms. And it's no longer about you trying to convince them. They're actually now looking at the opportunity cost of them not going ahead with your service. That is such a powerful question. Um, because I would remember if you don't mind, um, how 
I also got um, this question when I was asking one of my clients who was intending not to go ahead with uh, a coaching service that I was offering them. And, um, and I asked them why they wouldn't be able to do that because they were not confident enough in how they were going to, to, to carry on with the work. And then I asked them, what is the one thing that actually they enjoyed doing? And they said they enjoyed watching TV. One question I asked them was, how much does your television cost you? And they did mention it was a 56 inch, very proud of their TV. And it costed them about, you know, $2,000. But then I went ahead and I asked them, how much is it actually costing you to watch television every year, you know, we, instead of you actually taking on this course, all right? In that year, we calculated they could actually start making up to $150,000 a year. So instead of that television, you know, costing them $2,000, it is now costing them $150,000 a year just sitting there and watching TV. So obviously, I do understand from, from a personal point of view how that question is quite powerful for whoever is watching this and i can't thank you enough for all the points that you've been elaborating uh to us the fourth step system and then the three um you know the three plus layer i was also learning while we were going um you know through all of those things now my uh, matthew if somebody's watching this video and obviously somebody is actually now thinking okay i really need to up my game i really need to figure out how you know, I can learn all the attitudes, the behaviors and all the competencies and the disciplines that are required to shorten the sales cycle. How can people actually get a hold of you? So uh, there's a number of ways. Look, I put up a, uh, you know, connect with me on LinkedIn, of course, on Facebook, Matthew White, just find me. Uh, of course, Velocity Selling. If somebody wants to go out there and grab a free seven day trial of our online training, you can do that. Uh, so just jump onto velocityselling.com. Uh, click on the, uh, the the free seven day trial and actually see where all of this stuff actually originated from from the from the guru himself uh, Bob Urichuk. There are literally uh, hundreds of videos there. It's all a guided journey, and this has been applied to businesses like the Marriott Group, Bulgari, all the way through down to uh, digital agencies, coaching agencies, people like that. You know, I, I take my own medicine as well. So uh, you know, there's there's a, a, a lot of discipline that's required because you know what, Prosper, you know. Over the course of the last year, I've realized that information and knowledge is reasonably commoditized. It's the discipline and the ability to apply it and the accountability that's actually the difference between what um, uh, you know, Anthony Robbins or Gary Vee are doing versus somebody who's struggling to get their next client. Great. But execution is the key. Great stuff. Well, hopefully somebody was taking notes as much as, um, you know, I was also facilitating this interview. I think I was in a sales lesson. Please don't send me a quotation or an invoice. Um, <laughs> for no for invoice. Oh, I'm out. Good night. Because <laughs> <laughs> I have taken down a, a few notes that I will also be utilizing in my own business. Now, viewers, obviously, you do see how much value we are uh, looking to provide in these shows. If you haven't subscribed to this channel, please do subscribe because our main um, belief is that we want your business to be profitable and enjoyable. Now, with um, experts like Matthew coming along, telling you exactly what it is, telling you exactly the attitudes, the behaviors, and what is actually working with the 21st century customer. And also noticing that most of the sales and uh, uh, marketing training that you've had is flat out wrong. We've been doing it wrong all the time. So now is the time to actually jump on board and start working with people that are actually kicking goals and making a profit within their business. Now, is there any sort of last tip that you might have for us there, uh, Matthew, that we might be able to utilize um, you know, moving forward? Yeah, look, I think that you need to put yourself in your buyer's shoes. And so the best way to do that is go speak to your top three to five, 10 customers. And they're gonna call your A-class customers. Now I'm gonna quickly break customers into three groups, A, B, and C. And that's not A for good, B for average, and C for crap. It's A for absolute. If you are fully funded, you only work with people that paid you on time, loved what you did, they're your A-class customers. B for beneficial, everybody wins. And C is for convenient. And most businesses spend their time trying to acquire convenient clients who are going to give them 80% of their problems and only 20% of their value and, and their revenue. So have a think about your current business database. 
Who's giving you, who's actually great to work with? Who's paying you on time? Work with those people. Go and buy those people a coffee and have a conversation. Ask them this question. What, if you were asked, what do I do for you? Because if the customer can articulate what you do for them, then they will reinforce for themselves and where they will give out your referral, then you will get a perfect level of feedback about what you actually do for the customer. Because you think you provide coaching services or marketing services or sell bloody highlighters or whatever rubbish you do. But you know what you actually do? You actually provide a result and an outcome for the client. So go ask your clients what you actually do for them. That's my, that's my one tip because you need to be buyer focused in this marketplace. It's not about you and your products. It's about your buyer and what you can do for them. Oh, that is a valid question. What do I do for you? And viewers, could you write your um, response to this question in the comments below? What is it that this show is actually doing for you? Now, Matthew, I cannot thank you enough for your time, your expertise, and your knowledge that you've just dropped in this episode here. And um, yeah, thank you so much for your time. My pleasure, Prosper. And look, um, you know, if there's anything I can do for anybody out there, you know, maybe even you could put your questions uh, in the uh, in the comments, uh, tag me in, and I'll uh, I'll go ahead and answer them for you. Thank you so much, there, Matthew. All right, no problems at all. See you later. Bye for now.